All right, so we are entering now the second chapter of the book of Revelation. And um, this is really going to be, I think, helpful. Um, we really get to see, remember when, when after uh, the Lord uh, came back and um, he, they asked him, said, are you now going to restore the kingdom? And they told him it is not uh, uh, time for you to know these things. The Lord also said um, that there are many things that I want to share with you, but you are not able to bear them what now. So here he is now sharing this information with us, giving us information. And as we get into the, the, this book, good morning, we're going to see also that there are some things to this day that is going to be said and spoken in heaven, that was said and spoken in heaven, that John heard and was getting ready to write it down. But the Lord said, don't write that down. So there are still things that we are not really, uh, the Lord does not want us to hear yet. Uh, and those are the those are the things that the seven thunders uttered while John was getting this revelation in, in heaven. <clears throat> but what's beautiful now, what we're going to embark on today, uh, uh, today, is what the Lord does want us to know. So what he's saying, this is coming from, from our Lord. He's saying, these are the things I need you to understand. And he's talking to the church. But what you've got to keep in mind is that, remember when the Lord gave the parable of the um, <clears throat> the, uh, the the two people that went down to pray and he said that one man went down to pray and he said Lord I thank you that I'm not like this heathen or this sinner or this other person over here and he said you know I fast twice a day I give tithes of all that I have you know he started talking about all his righteousness that he did right mm -hmm. But then the Lord said, but then the other man bowed down. It wouldn't even so much even lift his head up to heaven, but bowed his head and said, Lord, be what? Merciful, Merciful to me, a sinner. Yeah. Jesus said, the man that was humbled and, and recognized that he was a sinner, he got up justified rather than the other man. Now, why didn't the other man get justified? Because he felt he had what? Done enough in him what? In his self. So I didn't need to have the Lord. I've done it myself. I've actually produced a, a, a life that I think God would be proud of and thought he deserved certain things. Whereas the other man recognized, no matter how good I think I am, I'm a what? A sinner. Sin. And so he said, Lord, be merciful to me. A what? A sinner. Sin. So one man got up justified. The other man did not. And that speaks a lot about what the Lord is going to see in the church. The church is, is full of people that the Lord looks at as saying, this one's trusting in me, this one's listening to me, but not trusting in me. And it's a big difference. And when I saw that, it reminded me so much of the other parable. Remember the parable of the, the ten virgins? Five were wise, five were foolish. The wise, wise ones brought oil and were prepared and they were prepared because they, they, that represents them trusting, and the oil represents the Holy Spirit, them trusting in the Spirit of God uh, for their salvation. And so when the bridegroom came, they went, went what? In. But the other ones were left. So now here we go. Again, you know, the, the, uh, the man that bowed down and said, I'm a poor sinner, he rose up justified. The other one did not. These virgins went in to the bridegroom. The other ones did not. Remember the parable of the prodigal son? And I always looked at that as being so uh, instrumental in teaching the lesson about sometimes when you go away, you can always what? Come, Come back. Ahead. So the prodigal son, he said, give me my inheritance. Give me this. And he went out and he squandered all the, the riches in what? Riotous living. And then he came back. And when the father saw him come back, and he wanted to say, Lord, you know, uh, he said, wanted to say, Father, you know, forgive me for I have sinned. Uh, I, I'm willing to be just your hired servant. And the Lord said, no, you, you, the, the father said, no, you, you are my son. Come back, put a, a, a ring on his finger, put a robe on him 
and kill the what? The fat of calf. And they went into the what? In, into a banquet. They went to go eat. Who, what represents us going into the banquet? That's when we go into the, the marriage supper of the Lord. That's, it's, it kind of symbolized that. But you know what's interesting? When you look at that parable, who, and, and the, when the rich, when the, when the rich man, not the rich man, when the, when the father and the son, the prodigal son, went into the banquet, who didn't go in? The oldest son. Remember, he, didn't, he wouldn't even so much as go in there. Why? Because then when the father finally came out and said, you know, what's wrong with you? He goes, he goes, I've never done any of these things to you that, you know, that, that, your, that your other son has done, and yet you've never gone, given me anything. You know, and he goes, well, he went out and squandered everything, and then now you have a banquet for him. You notice the same mindset? The oldest son was thinking, I deserved, if anybody deserved a banquet, it should have been what? Me. He's working on what? What he deserves. And that's a bad aspect. And so therefore, we're going to see a lot of... And remember, Jesus gave that other, that other uh, uh, statement. He says, In the last day, many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not what? Prophesied in thy name. Cast out death. They talk about stuff that they did. Doesn't this qualify me? Look at what I did. All right? But the Lord said to them... Depart from me, you right. workers of what? Iniquity. Because they're bringing their own righteousness. And you can't do that. And so time and time and time again, the Lord is showing us, you have to trust me for righteousness. I need you just to go and do what you hear. But don't think because you do certain things that that's going to give you righteousness. Your righteousness has been given to you. That is a gift. You have perfected righteousness. It is what? My righteousness. The righteousness that Christ gives. He's saying, I give unto you. And it's important that we keep that in mind. Because we're going to see here, the Lord's going to talk to the church. And let the church know, the church got some issues. And a lot of times we got issues with points of view. How we see things. What we think means one thing when it really doesn't mean that you know all these uh, things that we think we score points with when, when in reality the Lord has been telling us time and time and time again this is what I'm looking for this is what I'm focusing on All right. so let's take a listen we're going to listen to this entire second chapter it's kind of long 29 verses it's going to talk to three churches but we're going to get back and we'll see if we can at least get through one of the churches today alright so let's take a listen to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, 
even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. And I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. All right. A lot of information in there. And I think it's just important. I don't know really how far we're going to get today with this, but I really want to try to um, just take my time and just remember, this is what the Lord is saying to the churches. All right? Let's, let's just dig in there. There's a lot of preliminary I can say. I think it would be good for me just to just start it. And I think a lot of the stuff that I would say in preliminary would actually come out. This way we can try to get through it, but at the same time we'll take our time. First of all, it says, unto the angel of the church. Now, the word angel here means messenger. It's a person that is in charge with delivering a what? A message. So usually that would mean the teacher, the pastor, the, the person that is uh, uh, giving the instruction, the person that is giving a direction, to, is saying that I'm writing to you. Now, if you are a parent and you call one of your children over, you call the, the oldest child over and you say, go tell the younger child, I said, come here. And then you wait 15 minutes and you notice that the younger child never arrived. So you go to a younger child, didn't I tell you to come here? And you go, I didn't hear you say come here. Didn't the older child, didn't, my, didn't so and so tell you to come here? He never told me. Now who's in trouble? The older child. The older child. You go back to the other. Didn't I tell you to tell him to do what? To come here. Well, I didn't think it was important. That child's in trouble, right? So imagine when the Lord says, I'm telling you to tell the people this. And what would happen if that person said, well, I don't think this is important. I wouldn't want to be in that person's shoes. Right? So therefore, keep in mind, to whom much is given, much is, much is required. required. And so one of the things that's important is that you are going through this book. And when you go through this book, you can't say, I didn't know. You now know. You, you have been you have received this, this information and 
the Lord will then speak to your heart as to what to do with it. And guess what? He expects you to what? To do it. Right? Let's take a listen. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. All right. Now Ephesus, all these churches are located in what's called back then Asia Minor, which is around that Turkey area. Now I could do a whole lot. I could spend a lot of time in geography and, and talking about the location. That's something I'm going to leave for you as an individual to do. And I think it's an interesting thing if you want to go online, check, check, type in, you know, Ephesus and find out where was it. Look up Asia Minor. Look at these different locations. There's some things about certain of these cities that I will bring out, like when we get to the city of Laodicea, it's important to know where they're located, which is why the Lord talks about them having uh, them being like lukewarm water, because it, it has actually something to do with their geography and how they actually got their water. We'll get into that. But other than that, we're not going to get into it unless it really is pertinent to the teaching as to why he said that uh, to them uh, if the geography comes into play. But Ephesus is one of the letters uh, uh, that even Paul, one of the churches that even Paul wrote to. Paul wrote to the to the Ephesians. All right, and there are a lot of things that, that will be parallel to what the Lord is saying here that actually Paul said to the Ephesians. All right, but look at what he says: "Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things saith he that holdeth the what seven seven stars in his right hand." Now remember. And in chapter 1, remember when John saw the revelation of the Lord and he saw this and he saw uh, him holding what? Seven stars in his hand. All right. So what, was that, what did that represent? And actually in, in here, the, the Lord tells us what that means. Because if we go back to chapter 1 and we look at verse 20, it says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand uh, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou saw are the seven what? Churches. So we've been already given the key. Remember, John was caught up in the what? In the spirit. So how, what is he seeing? He's seeing things from a what kind of perspective? A spiritual perspective. That means things don't always look like how they look like in our natural three-dimensional reality. All right? You know, and three in three-dimensional reality, if I if I take this pen and I let it go, it's supposed to do what? Every time. It's supposed to do what? It's supposed to do that. In the spiritual realm, it's not always like that. You might you may be able to let it go and it may stay there. You may be able to let it go and it may go to somebody else. You see what I'm saying? So you always got to keep in mind that when you're in the spiritual realm, it doesn't always follow the same uh, uh, constructs that our natural world has. So therefore, that's why when John is giving descriptions of things, he can't tell you what it is. Because there's nothing here that does what? That correlates to it. So he has to say, this is what? Like. Very important pieces to keep in mind. So this is why you see these things in different things and different phrases. Uh, the candlesticks, right? He says, uh, "Behold." Uh, going back to the second chapter, uh, right into the church of Ephesus, right? These things saith he that holds the seven what stars in his right hand, and we already saw that the, the seven stars which thou sawest in the right hand uh, are what. The seven angels, exactly. So uh, I, I have all the messengers in my hand. In other words, I control the message. I, if a person is given my message, he is what? In my hands. False messages will come, and he's going to talk about that. They don't come from what? From me. And we're going to see in a minute. They're going to come from the deceiver. Because uh, it's going to say they, you found them to be liars. And who is the father of all lies? Okay, so we're going to see that in just a bit. So, so when he gives his description, and we're going to see this from all of the churches, when he gives his description, you're going to, it's going to always refer back to something that John described in the, chapter, the first chapter as to how he looked. Remember he said it looked like his eyes were as a flame of fire because his eyes are piercing. His eyes see through all the... The, 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 the hay wood and stubble and see what's what actually real because the Lord is he's seeing the Lord in a spiritual aspect and we talked about that that if you see people spiritually 
you see through all the what? The phoniness. You burn right through it. All right? We can't do that in the natural realm. When somebody says, you know, I'm this or I'm that, we, we just have to wait and, and see. But in the spiritual realm, boom, if there, there is no, you don't have to, you can see right through it. We talked about when it said that Jesus, when John saw him, and there were, uh, his, his words were like a what? Like a sword coming out of his mouth. And that sword at that time represented the what? The authority. Somebody was, had a sword, they were a Roman soldier or somebody. And I said, well, if we bring it into our day today, if I was to go into my crate here and pull out a Uzi, who's got all the authority right now? You. What I say, what? Goes. Why? Because I got authority to back up what I say. So if I say sit down and you don't want to sit down, I can kind of make you sit down, right? Just mm -hmm. shoot your kneecap, you're going to sit down. Mm -hmm. All right. But that's what that means. So once again, I'm trying to get you to see. you got to think what? Spiritually. All right? And I, I have to overemphasize that because if you don't think spiritually, the book of Revelations will get confusing. All right? So let's, take, let's keep going now. All right, he has seven, seven stars in his right hand who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So he's walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which are the what? Churches. churches. So who walks in the midst of the churches? Jesus. All right. So Jesus is always here. He said, "With well, two or three are gathered, there I am with you. Okay, but you said, well, I don't see him because we're only looking right now in the what? Natural. If God was to open our eyes to see spiritual things, not only would we see the Lord Jesus, we would see some of his angels, but we also would see what? Demons. And we would see the angels fighting for us. And we, would see, we would actually see what our prayers were doing. We can't see that right now. We'd be able to see all that stuff. But we can't. We're blinded to that right now. All right? So Jesus is in the midst. All right? Verse 2. I know thy works. Why does he know his works? Because he's here with us. He's here with you what? All the time. I know what, you have, what you've done. All right? Now look what he's saying. Uh, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. So he's saying, I know what you have done. I know how hard you work. And I know how sometimes when you work it hard and it seems like nothing is happening, you don't what? You don't quit. Your patience. And how thou cannot bear them which bear, you cannot bear them which are what? Evil. So they actually don't enjoy being in the presence of evil. Because evil comes from who? From the devil. We got to watch that because today our our whole philosophy of life is around being entertained sometimes by evil. We're entertained by it. I mean, look at our look at our movies, our TV shows, and we we have been engrossed in the system that we have to where some of the stuff we find comical and funny and entertaining and it's like you just have to watch that. The Church of Ephesus, they couldn't. They they. They were not part of it. They did not enjoy it. He says, I know how you cannot bear them which are evil. You can't always get, a, get away from the presence of evil, but you don't have to do what? Enjoy it. And thou hast tried them, all right, now here's important, which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them what? Liars. So people that say, I'm an apostle. So here's an individual that's not trying to say, well, I don't believe in God. He's, this is not the atheist. This is not the person that says, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe. This is the person that says, I, I believe in God. I believe in, you know, working the, the works of God and everything. And they say they are of the Lord. But the Lord does not have them in his hand. He has what in his hand? All the messengers are with in God's hand. All right. But he says, I don't have them. But just because a person is not in the hand of the Lord with the message that he brings does not mean that they won't try to tell you I'm of the Lord. So he's saying to the Ephesus church, I'm going to give you guys credit because you look through stuff. You pray and ask for discernment and you don't fall for everything hook, line, and sinker. You try those that say they are apostles and are not and have found them to be what? Liars. You are a liar and, uh, uh, and a murderer, a murderer and a liar. This is what Jesus said to the, to the, the religious leaders of his day. Uh, and you do the works of, your, of what? Your father. Because he was a what? Liar a lie. from the beginning. So who was the father of lies? The devil. The devil. <laughs> All right. 
And these people actually are walking in the name that they have the Lord, but they don't have them. And it's in name only. We're going to see that again too. Uh, by another church that's doing that. Look at verse 3. And has borne them that have uh, that have, bo blah, blah, blah. have borne and have patience and and for my name's sake has labored and has not what? Fainted. It means you did not give up. Hard work, people dis did not liking what you're doing, not getting discouraged because everybody ain't agreeing with you, but you labored and you did not quit. You see that these people actually were on their job. Now, it's important that I lay this out as well. Um, when we look at all of these churches, and there are seven of them that the Lord's going to talk to, one thing that you're going to keep in mind is that he was talking to the real individual churches of that day. But like everything that the Lord does, because the words of the Lord are spiritual, they don't just have one dimension of purpose. They have multiple purposes. So he was talking to those direct people at that church in Ephesus at that time that John, because John's going to take this letter to them. But it didn't stop there. There's another dimensional aspect to how they applied. Because he also says, uh, at the end, he goes, uh, to pass this letter, let the church hear. So he said, pass this letter to all the churches and let all churches hear. So this letter is also not just to that particular church, but it's to what? Churches of what? Of all time. Okay. Plus, he's also going to say, let him that hath a what? Ear hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So if it's, if he's saying, let he that hath an ear, that means it's not only to the specific church and the churches of all time, but it's also to every what? Individual. If you got an ear, this message is what? To you. Plus, this also is going to be representative of how God's church will move throughout the life of the church. This is the beginning of the church. All right? When the Holy Spirit came and the church began, um, this was the mystery. He says, behold, I, you know, I showed you a mystery about the, the, the aspect about the beginning of the church. This is what Paul was trying to get the individuals to, to see that the Lord is calling these Gentiles out and he's going to have and these people are going to have the same blessings that the, the, the Jewish believers have. Well, all throughout the ages from the beginning of the church until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, these churches show a model of the spirit and the, and the aptitude that the church will have at each stage. Now you go, well really? Does that really... I go, well, if you look at it, if the churches were in any other order, it wouldn't work. So this is the apost apostolic church, the very first church, the church that still had some of the apostles and the disciples that actually walked with Jesus. That's the first church. And as you move along, you'll see we're going to get to the, the next church and you're going to have the, the Smyrna church, which was the persecuted church. Because, the, because shortly after that, the church was what? Persecuted by, by Nero. Uh, not only by the Jewish leaders, but then it's going to be persecuted by government. Now, if Smyrna was not the next church, was, if you had put like Laodicea there, if you switched the order, it wouldn't work. But because the order happens like that, the last church is the apostolic church. I mean, the, the, uh, the apostasy church. Because the church is going to go from apostolic to apostasy. Well, if you had the, the last church as being a, a church like, like uh, Smyrna, it wouldn't work according to biblical and church history. So you can see there is a direct church message. There is a message to churches for all ages, to every church. There is a message to the personal individual. And there's also a message to how the church age will, will have its, 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 its tenure, its way of doing things, its philosophy throughout all the ages. So in the last day, the church is going to be like the church the last church that we're going to talk about, which is Laodicea, which we have not gotten to, but when we get there, we're going to really get a whoop from the Lord. Lord's going to say, y'all are not doing things well. All right? But we're still in this apostle, apostolic church. All right? So he goes on, and he's saying all these wonderful things, and I think it's just important that I kind of pause, pause here for a moment just to give you that. He says, you guys do all this hard work. But look at verse 4. He goes, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, 
What does he have against this church? Because thou has what? Left thy first love. Underline the word left. It didn't say lost. It said what? Left. That means you stepped out. You just walked out. You began to focus more on the, the tasks and getting things done than love. Now, very good examples. Remember when Jesus was in the home of Mary and Martha? Mm -hmm. And Jesus was in the room and he was, and he was teaching. And uh, Martha was in the kitchen doing what? Preparing stuff and stuff. cooking and getting things ready. And what was Mary? Sitting at Jesus' Jesus feet. feet. And Martha came in and said, Lord, are you not going to uh, say anything to my sister? Because she leaves me to do what? All the, all the work. work. Hmm. And what did Jesus say? He says, Martha, Martha, you are concerned about what? Many things. But Mary has chose the what? The best. Yes. And I will not take that from her. It's more important to love being at the feet of Jesus than getting things accomplished. Cleaning up the, 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 the room and cooking the, the food and everything. That's going to get done. Don't worry so much about it. But if I'm here talking, where should you be? You should be listening. And so Mary chose the proper thing. Because Mary did not mistake tasks, which are important. You do got to clean the house. You do got to cook food. But don't get it twisted. There's nothing more important than knowing why you do anything and that's because you do what you love the, the, the Lord Jesus and what the Lord has done for you and who he is just loving God because he is what he is God that he is our, the, our, our giver of all things so I mean I think that's a great example and a great uh, 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 way of sometimes looking at that picture just to check to see where am I am I more concerned about everything you see, and that's the task of the devil. The devil wants us to be what? Worried. He wants us to be anxious. He wants us to be all bent out of shape because stuff comes at us and it keeps hitting us. One thing after another, one thing after another. And that's a clear sign that the devil is hitting you. Now, if you are not, if God doesn't put anything in you, then the devil can walk right by you because you'll never be a threat. But if there's something in you, he wants to suppress you right away. I don't even want you to get what? Started. All right, you remember the parable of the sower of the seeds? Mm -hmm. How the Lord so, so, said the good the sower went to sow some seeds, but, and they sowed some by the wayside, and immediately what? The birds of the air came and ate them up. And then when God gave the, the ex explanation of the parable, he said the seeds is what? The word of God. The, devil, the, the, the birds are the what? The devil. devil. So the minute the seeds are sown, before you, they even can get get into the ground, I'm picking them up. I don't want you to, to hear or understand any of this stuff. I want this stuff to just be like just foreign to you because if it gets in you, then what's in you, what God has planted in you will start to grow. And the devil wants to keep you busy with the stuff of the world. He wants you to have financial problems, health problems, family problems, uh, 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 problem problems, just every kind of thing you can have. So you are not focused on the seed that God has put into you and, and to get it to grow. And sometimes people go a whole lifetime. Sometimes people just go, and, and, and yet, but guess what? That seed is what? Still there. And all it needs is for a good word of God to hit, good sprinkling of the Spirit of God, and guess what happens? It grows. Because see, God is not uh, 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 going to be overpowered by the devil. And sometimes things take their time. And you go, really? I go, yeah, look at Moses. Moses was chosen by God from what? From birth. Mm -hmm. But he began to understand maybe I need to do something when he was what? 40. And then when he tried to do something, he did it all what? All wrong. Yeah. Ended up killing somebody. Turned himself into a murderer. Now, that ain't the right thing to do, Moses. Then he went out into the wilderness for how much longer? Another 40 years. So when he finally came back and finally the seed that God had put in him to do what he was supposed to do, how old was Moses? He's 80. <laughs> But he still got accomplished what God wanted him to get accomplished. So that's what it's never too late. God has you. He knows what he wants you to do. Uh, and, and just keep that in mind. But you can't leave and you can't allow these other things of this world to, to take away love God first. 
If you love God and just say, you know what, I want to get to know who Jesus is. Now, you might not have a clue as to how to do that, but you just do it. You just, you know, little things, you know, well, I'll start here, and I'll just do this, and I'll start this. I'm just going to get the word in me. And you'll be surprised how God will change your spiritual DNA. You will become a new person. The Bible says that you're no longer uh, the same. You'll become a what? A new creature in God. All right? And God can do that, and he can do it remarkably. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou hast what? Fallen. Why have you fallen? Because you have left your what? First, First love. love. And do what? Repent. That means you got to admit. And that's the important thing. Repent. We're going to see repent throughout all of this. That's one of the most important words in here. And what repent means is that what I've done, I admit it's wrong. The problem that people get into is when they try to justify wrong. If you're wrong, and even if you are wrong and you can't, I, I, I'm, I'm in the midst of wrong, I'm doing wrong or I did wrong, you have to just say it's wrong. You can't justify. You can't say, well, God... This is, I don't, that's what Balaam did. Balaam tried to ex explain away his, 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 uh, his deeds. And you can't justify wrong. What God has called wrong, what God has said is sin, what God has said is not of him, you have to do what? Agree with him. You have to agree with God. Then God can begin to work that situation out. All right? So you have to do this word. And I would say circle, underline, you know, highlight the word repent. Because that's important. Because what that says is, I agree with what God said. I'm not arguing with that. Now, I'm not doing everything because who is? I'm not perfect. Who is? But I don't challenge what God says is right. If God says this is wrong, guess what? If God said we should be doing this, guess what? We should be doing that. Regardless as to how I may be able to accomplish the task, it don't change it. Now I have to wait for God's power, God's uh, anointing to come upon, and God's help, God's direction, so I can begin to walk more like how I'm supposed to walk. But in the meantime, you cannot agree with wrong. You have to agree with what? With God. So it's important that we learn to repent. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly. And we'll remove thy candlestick. I'm going to take that church. I'll remove it. Uh, out of its place. Except thou, what? Repent. Alright. But then he goes on. He says, but this thou hast. And he's now going to say, now see. He, he, he told them what you got to work on. But I do still like some things that you're doing. And look at this. This is really important. Because you're going to see this twice. Thou, I, but thou hast... Uh, that they look. Let me just say, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also what hate. hate. What did God say? He what hate. hates the deeds of the what Nicolaitans. Do don't you think it's important to know what the Nicolaitans are? Mm -hmm. If God says I what hate it, hate. this is the most I would say underappreciated word or definition that I think is in the Bible. People don't like to talk about what the deeds of the Nicolaitans are because it cuts into some structures that the, the church had begun to build itself on. The word Nico means rule over and laity means people. And so the, the word says that when you build a structure of rule or hierarchy that says they're superior than the what? Than the people. Mm -hmm. And so if I was to say, well, because the Lord uh, gives me a message that makes me what? More spiritual than you guys. That would put me in the cast of what? The Nicolaitans. Mm -hmm. I have to always see myself as being what? No better than anybody else. That was one of the problems that Jesus had when he came up to, 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 uh, to earth because the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees were what? Lording over the people. They, and that's why the Lord went into the temple twice and did what? He, he said, you guys are 
this is supposed to be a house of prayer, you've turned it into a den of what? Den of thief. You're stealing from the people, you're lying to the people, and you're taking their money. And he went in there and knocked over the, the, the money changers because they were exchanging money, but wasn't exchanging it correctly. All right, and he knocked over all of those uh, the doves and the and the offerings and stuff that they were selling, the, the, the animals. He let he he broke the cages open, and he did this twice. Why did he do this? Because they were not doing proper. They were trying to lord over the person, the, the people. When Jesus died on the cross, one thing that happened in the temple was that this big veil did what? It ripped, ripped from the top to the bottom. That veil was there. The veil covered the what? The Holy of Holies. And that meant that only the priests could go in on a certain period of time and they could then commune with God and offer up a sacrifice for the sins of the people for that what? For that year. Yeah. But when Jesus died, the veil was rent. That means there's no longer a need for you to go to any other person. You can come to God what? Directly. Yourself. So structures like going to another man to confess your sin, that ain't of God. That's Nicolaitan stuff. Stuff to say that you got to go to a man, another man, to ask you know, uh, how much money I should be given and and how much uh, whether I should buy a house or before you buy a car, come ask me and I'll ask God for you. That's not of God. No. That's part of this Nicolaitan stuff here. People that say, well, you know, God will give me a vision for your life. Before he give it to you, because I'm your I'm your leader, or I'm your pastor. God give me the oversight for you. Guess what? Now that's why I personally think they don't like talking about this a lot of times because you have to begin to put people on the same plane. Even how things are structured. A lot of times our churches are structured in the sense that we gonna put these people what yeah. higher up, and you guys sit down here. Right. Even the whole structures. Now, I know sometimes people do it just so well, it's better visibility. And that could be true too, but that ain't why everybody does it. Mm-hmm. Not everybody does it. Other people say, well, you know, and they, oh, and, and if you happen to be an elder or a pastor and you're sitting in, sitting in the regular people seats, they tell you do what? Move. Come on up here. Sit up here where, where we are, where we sit. That's Nicolaitan stuff. We got to be careful. Um, not everybody does it with that aspect, but it becomes such a what traditional aspect of doing things, and they don't even know why they do it. They just do it because that's how it's always been what done. Yeah. Gotta watch out for stuff like that. I think it's important that we understand that. Uh, we, we're gonna see this again, but the thing about it is that Jesus didn't say, "I'm glad you're not doing the things of the Nicolaitans." He says, "I what? I hate, I hate it." I can't stand it because you're putting man, you're putting barriers. What Jesus said to the Pharisees, you guys are blind, what? Leaders of the blind, and you both will fall in the what? In the ditch. So you're telling the people, follow me, but you're blind. And so you're going to fall in the ditch, but the people that are following you are going to do what? Fall in the ditch. Who are we supposed to follow? Christ. Christ. All right. It's important that we do this. We have to point everybody to the Lord Jesus. He that hath an ear. Anybody can hear? Got, everybody got ears? Mm-hmm. Okay, what does it say? If you have an ear, he that has an ear, let him hear what the what? Spirit, Spirit. saith unto the churches. Alright, that's important to keep in mind. What the Spirit saith unto the churches. Um, to him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the what? Tree of what? Life. Tree of life. That means you will have eternal spiritual life. Eternal life. Right? Which is in the midst of the what? Paradise of God. So you're going to be where? In the paradise that God creates. Ain't that where you want to be? I know that's where Amen. I want to be. Right? Let's take a look at this next church. We may be able to get this next church in. It's important. All right? Unto the angel... Which is what? The messenger. The messenger. Of the church of Smyrna. Right. All right. Now Smyrna is another church. The, the word Smyrna happens to come. One of the, the words in it is myrrh. And you know myrrh is that spice. Right. All right. And, and when the, the, um, when the magi came to 
uh, Jesus is uh, at the, to, to meet Jesus and we always see them coming in the manger but in reality they didn't come in the manger because when they came Jesus was already a child but anyway but when they came one of the gifts that was given to the Lord Jesus was was myrrh they gave him gold frankincense and myrrh gold because he was the king and the myrrh represents his his being crushed because myrrh is a as a, 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 a spice or a, a, a something that gives off an aroma but you don't get it until it's crushed and so it represents Jesus being what crushed right? he was he was bruised for our iniquity and by his stripes we are what we are healed all right and so unto the to the angel of the church of Smyrna right these things saith the what the first and the last all right he which was dead and is alive now it's important to keep in mind he's letting you know I'm not, the first and the last is such an important aspect that means there's nothing what before me, before me and nothing, nothing what after me. anything that happens in anything in any type of creation or any type of reality is contained within what within me mm -hmm. alright and that's an important thing sometimes it's like it's, it's important to keep in mind which was dead and what is now alive. alive so he's letting you know I also did what suffered I was what I was uh, 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 I suffered I was bruised and then I did what? I gave up the lot. I gave up the ghost. The ghost. All right. I was dead and am alive. So he's letting you know that there is that resurrection aspect. That if it happens to me, I'm the first fruits. It can happen to what? To you. Now, why is he telling them that? Well, when we get into the letter, we'll see why. All right. And the description that he gives of himself is helpful to the to the church for what they got to deal deal with. Look what he says in the ninth verse. I know thy works. Very important. Why does he know the works? Because he's what? In the midst. In the midst. All right. All right. I know thy works. And tribulation. They have gone through what? Tribulation. They've gone through. Not, not the great tribulation, but they've gone through what? Tribulation. Trouble. Trouble. Persecution. This is the church. That this church is, is in an area where they are really being persecuted. Now, when you look at it from the church Historical standpoints, this represents the, the, the age when the church was persecuted. Before the time of Constantine. Constantine is uh, the, the one that made being a, a Christian popular because he made it the state religion. And that's going to be representative by the next church that we see. But right now, this is the church that has been persecuted by Nero, by the Jewish, Jewish uh, um, um, uh, leaders. Uh, Rome is really uh, at a point where they're looking at this church as being uh, at the church as being you know a a threat, and even from a local true at that moment point of view, this church was in an area where they were not liked, they were not ap appreciated, and they were what they were persecuted. All right, but he says, I know that trouble and poverty, and they didn't they didn't have you know the name it and claim it thing going on. They didn't have the riches and, and all that. They had what? Poverty. poverty. What kind of poverty did they have? They didn't have a lot of money. Right. They didn't have a lot of land. Right. They didn't have a whole lot of you know acres and acres of, 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 of grain and wheat. And all. Yeah. They didn't have all that. So from a natural standpoint, they were what? They were poor. poor. Well, look what Jesus says. And, and I, I know that tribulation and that poverty, but what does it say? Thou art, art what? Rich. rich. If the Lord says you're rich, you might not have a dime in your pocket. Guess what you are? Rich. You're rich. That means God's going to take care of you. But see, the thing we think about is, well, that means I'm going to be all right here. God says he's focusing more so on your spiritual well-being than on your what? Your natural. Okay? Because we're going to see that in a bit now. He said you are rich. Right? Always keep that in mind. This church, no matter what they think, they are what? They're, They're rich. rich. Keep that in mind. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not. Right? These people that are persecuting them, a lot of them are religious, Jewish religious leaders. They say they are what? Jews and are not. Remember that first church, Ephesus? Mm -hmm. And they said that they knew how to handle those people that say they are what? Apostles, but were not. Look at all this false representation. Once again, the main attack on the true things of God is not the atheist. It's the false what? Religious person that claims to be 
I, they say they are apostles. They say they are God's chosen people. They say they are Jews, but are what? Are not. not. Once again, we got, and where does all this come from? From the devil. Remember when we, we, we read in, uh, in Jude, I know that from, uh, from, a, uh, from amongst you, was it Jude or anyway, Paul, he said from, from among you shall come deceitful workers. That means people will, will kind of be groomed within the organization of the church, but they were planted there by who? By the yeah. devil. Right. So not everybody that's in the, the church is of who? Of, of God. God. Alright, but look at what he says. I know thy works are tribulation and thy poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not. When we read the um, Ten Commandments and it says, Thou shalt not take the, 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 the name of the Lord thy God in vain. A lot of people say that means cursing. It does not mean that. What it means is you take his name, but don't live by it. You take his name in vain. I have, I mean, to put a shirt on that says, I'm a Christian, and live like the devil. Mm -hmm. And believe like the devil. And act like the devil. Mm -hmm. And don't believe in God. Don't trust God for anything. You took his name in what? In vain. So you have to make sure that you are following. And how do you know that? By always agreeing with what, what, what God says. That means you've got to repent of your own thinking and then follow the thinking of who? Of God. Alright? Then which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of who? Satan. Alright? Of the synagogue of Satan. The synagogue represents a what? A house of God. A house of God. They're not of the house of God of, of the Lord Jesus. They're, they're of their, their house is the synagogue of who? Satan. Satan. That's who they are. Satan planted these people there. Remember the, the parable that Jesus gave? When he planted the good seed, mm -hmm. and then while men slept, someone came and planted what? The bad seed. He planted the wheat, and then all of a sudden these what? Tares grew up. And they said, who planted them? And they said, the enemy. And he said, the enemy is the who? It's the yeah. devil. All right. So it's important to keep that in mind. All right. But these people are of the synagogue of Satan. They say they're Jews, but they're not. They're really who? Children of the devil. Mm -hmm. But look what he says in 10. He says, fear none of those things. See, that's, once again, what the devil wants. He wants you to be worried, anxious, have fear. But the, how many times, you look at one of the most quoted words that Jesus says, it's what? Fear not. Now, why does he have to keep telling you to fear not? Because he knows that the devil is trying to put you in a position to have fear, worries, anxiety. What did Jesus say? Cast your cares on me because I care for you. And because you can't handle it. If you try to handle all that, guess what you're going to do? You're going to go insane. The devil wants you to get depressed, wants you to get worried, wants you to quit, wants you to, you know. And God says, yeah, if you try to handle all that yourself, yeah, you're going to get there. The devil will succeed. But I'm telling you, don't let it happen. Take your cares and give them to me. So what does that mean? How do I actually do that? You pray about it. You ask God to give you wisdom. And then you say, I'm done. Now go on and find the good things that God wants you to do. And move along. And, and it don't mean that you don't have a, a concern or, or, or focus. And you don't ignore situations. But you do take the worry and the fear and you do what? You cast it to the Lord. I'm not worried about this. And you ask God to help you with that. Because see, nobody can teach you how to do that. God just has to what? Do it for you. I can't teach you how to trust God. You just have to go to God and ask God to do what? Show me how to teach, how to trust you. And that's what this church at Smyrna uh, is doing. All right, it says, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. So what is he saying? You're going to do what? Suffer. You're going to go through some things. But don't fear. Endure it. It's not, going to, it's not the saying that everything's going to be good. And that's the problem that sometimes we think. That, well, if I follow God, that means everything's going to work out perfect. No. You're going to have some things that, that, that are in the category of suffering. But don't fear. Don't get anxious. Just allow it to happen. 
Well, to, the, to what degree should I allow it to happen? Let's keep reading. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you in prison. All right, so even to the point where you're going to be in prison unlawfully. Now, see, the problem we often think about, we often think about, and this is for them, this is true, but it doesn't stop there. Prisons as being what? A place where they put bars and confine your ability to move in the three-dimensional world that we live in. You can't go but so far. But there are more prisons than just bars. That's right. There's prisons of finance. God can put, because you look at things that you would like to have for yourself or for your family, and you go to get those things, and you walk smack into bars of insufficient funds. Mm -hmm. Anybody been in that kind of prison before? <laughs> right, the devil loves putting people in that kind of prison. Right, but the Lord says, I know the devil will put some of you in prison. So we all are in different, different kinds of prisons. But guess what? If you're trusting God, he knows you're there. And at a certain point in time, guess what he can do? He come and open the door. Remember when, when Paul, when, when uh, uh, Peter was in prison? Mm -hmm. And they were praying to get him free. And the angel came in and just, he touched the guard. The guard fell, just fell out. And he opened up the prison doors and, and took Peter out by his hand. There's a time when God will just, I'm Peter here. Peter or Paul? That was Peter. That was Peter. And he said, I'm going to pull you right out, of, right out of prison. Remember, Paul Paul stayed in prison. And then he ended up getting what? Paul got his head chopped off. Now, Peter got put to death too. Yeah. But you know, well, let's since we're on it, let's keep reading. We want to get done here in a minute. Um, ten. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation for ten days. Now, what that means, ten days? That's a, that's like an idiot means. This is for a certain period of time. If somebody says, how long does it take? Oh, it takes about 10, 10 minutes. Now, does it always, when somebody says it takes about 10 minutes, does that mean it's going to be 10 minutes? It could, you know, it could be relatively. It could, be, it could mean 5 minutes or it could mean you know, 20 minutes or half an hour. But you're basically saying, it's not going to take that long a period of time. All right? So that's what 10 days means. You're going to be there for a while, but you know, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a long period of time. You're going to have to just endure it from just to 10 days. It represents you know, just, a, just a portion of time. So you will be cast into prison for 10 days. All right. Uh, be there faithful. What? Unto death. And I will give you a crown of life. So even if you're there, and even if it costs you your natural life, still be what? Faithful. If somebody says, well, well we're going to do this to you, and if you don't do this, we're going to put you to death. You got to be like those Hebrew boys. You, you just got to do what you got to do. I'm not even going to be mindful to think about what, you, what you're going to do. Because if you put me to death, it's because God's going to allow it. But I know God can deliver me. And that's the strength that we need to have. And that easier, it's, it's a whole lot easier said than done. Amen. But as you begin to trust God, you'll be surprised what you'll be able to stand up against. Amen. All right? He will put some, uh, 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 be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee, what? A crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the what? To the churches. So, in other words, if you, if you are an individual with ears, you should be listening to this. He that overcometh shall not be hurt by the what? Second death. That's the death you want to avoid. Because see, the second death, see, the first death that, that people experience is the death of the what? Of the natural body. But the second death, which you don't want, is the death of your spirit and soul. You don't want spiritual death. You want spiritual life. All right, and we're going to stop there. And we'll pick up with uh, the Church of Pergamos on next week. Um, there's a lot we can say on that. Uh, but I'm trying to just make sure that we get the, the flow on this. That Jesus is talking to these churches. He's talking to the spirit of the, of the day. He's talking to the spirit of now. Of how we're living. But he's also talking to what us as individuals. And it's important that we understand that. All right. Any other comments or, or questions concerning what we said today?